Hey everyone, uh, it's Sean. I'm sorry that I'm not there tonight. Um, I've been dealing with a flu and my whole body is just aching, so I figure instead of getting anybody else sick or just being miserable myself, I would just record here and then post the video. Hopefully that actually kind of works out because there's a lot of content here and um, when I record it I find that we get through it a lot faster um, so we can like cover a huge portion relatively quickly and then you can just if you kind of miss a spot you just go back in the video and rewatch that part. Anyways essentially what we're going to learn today is arrays. Uh, we're going to basically talk about um, what they are, how you use them, and what the syntax looks like in JavaScript because I know it's it's not necessarily different than yeah. say any other language that you work with but it's different enough that it's worthwhile to take a look at. Plus you have a whole bunch of helper methods on arrays that um, make life a little easier. Things like map and filter and reduce and stuff like that. Uh, so I think it's pretty cool to to learn all that stuff. You know that's why we use JavaScript. It's this wonderful loose language that we get to kind of play with and we don't necessarily get all these really cool methods in stricter languages like C++ for example. Uh, anyways, so uh, after that, after we walk through like the intro part to the array, we're going to move on to this little tic-tac-toe game um, and basically we'll implement this tic-tac-toe game using arrays and some loops and some other syntax that we've learned and you'll be able to play tic-tac-toe. And I have built an AI. It's not the most intelligent AI in the world. It's pretty literal. Um, at the end of this, I'll review the logic that I used for the AI, and if you want to rebuild it, you can go ahead. But it uh, it will attempt to stop you as you play, um, but it's not hard to beat. And then we'll also build a reset game button. I do believe it was this class, the Thursday class that I actually mentioned before, about the ability to replay once we've finished a game. And there's two ways we could have did that. We could have did it with a loop, or we can do a simple reset game um, button. But anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. All right, let's uh, do what we usually do. We're going to go into our client-side JavaScript. And this is a wonderful thing to do with the browser size. I'm just going to click there, go into weekly learning. Scroll to where it says week three arrays. And you'll notice there's a whole bunch of things available here under week three. There is a review link. If you click on the review link, there's a survey here. It looks like Tuesday has already filled out some of it. Please feel free to go ahead and fill out the survey. It kind of lets me know. It's like a survey slash test. Basically kind of tells me where you're at and how you're doing with the actual content. Um, I've got the array starter files, that's what we're going to need, so we'll click that, pull those down. I'm just going to stick these on my desktop. I'm just going to change the name slightly to, whoops, it's not Monday. Feels like a Monday, but it's not, it's not Monday. <laughs> Alright, so those are going to be downloaded. I'm just going to show those in the finder. Go ahead and extract those get rid of that file folder. I'm just going to rename this so I remember whose it is. There we go. And then I'm going to open that up in my IDE. Now I have my IDE open over here and we have been going to file and open to open things but you can then some IDEs you can just drag the folder right into it and then it becomes available inside um, I don't know what they call this the dock or whatever the it's where you see your files, essentially, but it becomes available in this sidebar, basically. Um, that's an easy way to kind of see what's going on. And then with Chrome on the other side, you can go into the starters, just grab the index file, and whoops, we don't want to do that. We want to create a new tab, grab the index file and drop it in the tab, and now we're into the arrays portion of our page. All right, so I'm going to make this dock to the left, this dock to the right, and I'm going to open up my console window and just stick that at the bottom so we can kind of see what's going on with it. Just raise that up a bit, clear it. Cool, I think we're all set to start talking about arrays. Um, so now arrays, as we know, are lists, right? We, we use arrays often when we want to hold a list of different items. Now I did show a few weeks ago uh, one of the ways 
like an array, an example of array, we took basically Bob, 39, and true to demonstrate the fact that arrays in JavaScript are dynamic. And they don't really, it doesn't really matter what the values are in the array. It doesn't care. They're not data typed. So you don't have to make sure that all these are strings or characters or integers or floats. You can literally populate them with whatever you want. That being said, it's not something that you would likely do. You might do a nested array like this where you have multiple pieces like this. Uh, we'll say Sarah and 24 and false, for example. And then you might have this nested inside a parent array, right? Which basically creates a multi-dimensional array. Um, that's, that's common. That is something you might see. Um, but for the most part, when we have these kind of pieces like this, just like we would do in a strict language, we would build a class or a struct or an object that basically has these values inside of it, right? Anyways. So it is important to understand that when we work with arrays, we want to try to keep the list, you know, contextual. That every the values in the list relatively work together. So let's take a look at our index file. We'll open up our index file first. I believe I have everything already connected up. I don't think we actually need to connect anything. It looks like it's okay. Uh, yeah. So we're done with this file. Then we'll just go straight right into our arrays.js file. And we'll start at step one, like we usually do. There we go. So the first step is we're going to grab the arrays section from that index file. If you look at the index file, you can see that there is an arrays section. It currently has the ID of arrays. So in order to grab that, it's very simple. First, we want to be able to store it into a variable. So we'll call it section arrays. We access the document object model. We run query selector on it, and our selector is a normal CSS selector, same as if we were to select any element with an ID, we use this selector, it's hashtag arrays, and then that now gives us the array element. Now if I want to see that in my console, I can run console.log section arrays, like so, save it, refresh over here and we can see our section in here. Now I'm just going to get rid of these little warnings because these warnings are um, a little bit more severe than they need to be. So I'll just get rid of verbose and the warnings and there we go. So I have section ID arrays. Now in Chrome it shows it as the actual uh, HTML code because it calls to string on it. And the problem with that is that, as you can see when I hover over it, it's kind of cool because it shows me where the element is actually located. The problem is it doesn't show me the properties or methods that are actually attached to this thing. If I want to see the properties and methods on the particular element that I have selected, I have to change .log to dir, refresh my browser, and then now I get this cool little arrow. And we can see that the selector is section hashtag arrays. If I click the arrow, I'm just going to close off this little thing here. If I click the arrow, you can see a list of different things that are a part of this that are properties and methods attached to this particular element. And you can tell what's a property and a method because a method will generally have an F beside it to let you know that it is a method. Um, there's a whole bunch of properties in this thing. There's tons and tons and tons. We can also see what prototype it is a part of. It is a part of the HTML element. That's the prototype that it belongs to. So it's kind of cool because you get a lot more information about what you have available to you on this particular thing that you've selected. So that's kind of handy. Anyway, so we've selected this document dot, we've selected the hashtag arrays section, right? Using the document dot query selector. And we're going to talk more about this particular thing in two weeks. Um, so don't get too hung up on it now in case you, you know, incidentally don't understand it. Let's talk about um, arrays. So first array we're going to create is a one-dimensional array and we'll just make it as superheroes. So we'll do let superhero teams and we'll just use a superhero team, create the array, and then inside of it we just put the list of elements that we want. So we'll do Avengers, 
the Fantastic with a capital F. I have a keyboard that I'm not exactly fond of that I use at home. It's just a bit, I don't know, it's like the, the keys don't press or aren't nearly as responsive as I like, but it suffices. All right, so there we go. We have a list of three items, and the idea is that we separate our list items with a comma, and that tells us that we have a list. Now, um, I believe in JavaScript, it does support trailing commas, which means you can have a comma at the end, and it won't get mad. Yeah, it doesn't get mad. We can see output our cons like our superhero team. We'll do output superhero teams. Save that. Refreshed, and we can see there's our superhero team, the three elements. Again, we have this cool little arrow that when we click on it, it shows us all the different things um, that are listed inside. Or so, sorry, it shows all the elements listed inside the array, as well as a property, any properties that are associated with the array. So you can see we have a property called length here. If I wanted to actually see that value in the console.log, I would just add dot length. Save and refresh my browser, and as you can see, I get three. So that three, this dot length, is actually associating to the number of elements that are currently inside this array. All right, so I'm going to save that and refresh again. And I'll show you, we also have methods available to us on this array. They're under the proto method. And if we look, we can see all the methods begin with this cool little f. And it actually, if you hover over it, it tells you that it's a function. Now, if you it's not very clear when you look at it what it is that it does. Like some of them make sense, like join, you know, it, I'm sure you can figure out what that does, you know, or every or fill and stuff like that. They're kind of easy to figure out what they're doing. But if you do get hung up and you're not sure what some of these are, like for example, let's take a look at filter. You can always in your browser just go to, um, I usually just type in js.fill like that as a function and I hit enter. And then usually the top thing will be MDN. Did I type fill with one L? I did. <laughs> Let's do it with two Ls. There we go. Usually the top one will be your, your Mozilla developer network. Click on it. It leads to this. We haven't really looked at this all that in depth, but usually it gives you a demonstration as the first piece. This little sentence here tells you exactly what it's doing. This method fills all the elements of an array from a start index to an end index with a static value, which basically means, like, for example, if you take a look at what they've done here, uh, array one dot fill with zero, two, and four means that it will fill from position zero. So all arrays inside JavaScript are indexed at zero. So it's going to fill from position zero to position two. So that's from here to here. Uh, with the number four. Okay, so it will fill from with, nope, sorry, I've got that wrong. It's the number that you want to fill with or the value you want to fill with, the start and the end. It helps if you read what it's doing. So it's going to take from position two, which is here, to position four, which is basically beyond that because that would be position three. And you can see that's exactly what it's done. It's filled this with zeros, right? <laughs> not too hard, probably not something you'll use all that often, but hey, it comes in handy, I'm sure. All right, so let's go back to arrays. Anyways, there's a whole bunch of these, and we're actually going to talk about quite a few of these um, just to give you some experience with using them uh, and so that you understand how they work because some of them take, um, some of them just take simple values, some of them take, you know, a, a function like a callback that they require in order to operate. So we'll take a look at a few of those. All right, so the next piece, uh, let's just get rid of that. Step two, output the arrays to the console. Well, we kind of just did that. We output that array to the console already, but I mean, we can do it again. Let's just fill out the type or the, um, the syntax. Superhero teams, hit save, <coughs> refresh. Now I'm just gonna make my life a little bit easier. And I'm essentially going to output our logic from here. Just, I, I have a, it's a module that basically allows me just to refresh this browser 
without needing to constantly click refresh. Every time I save here, it will just refresh over here. And uh, if, in case you're curious on how I'm doing this, um, if you go to the weekly learning resources, pillars, you can find the information on installing live server right here in case you want to do it. It's not something that we're going to talk about right away and it's not necessarily important to have. It just makes things a little cooler because you can save and immediately see the update right away. Uh, I'm going to go to there. I can't remember the name of this file, so I'll just do that. Uh, CD starter arrays Thursday. There we go. And then I'll run live server. There, that's a little better. Cool. This is just mad because I don't have a favicon. We'll move that out of the way. I'll just refresh and then we'll just leave it like that. So now we have the live reload enabled and showing out everything I do. So if I change this to dot length, for example, and save, it updates on the right hand side and you can see we've got the change. All right, so that'll make things a little quicker. All right, so uh, we're gonna console.logout superhero teams. Now we're gonna turn our array into a multi-dimensional array. Well, we're not actually gonna turn this array into a multi-dimensional array. We're gonna create a new array that will be multi-dimensional. So we're gonna do let team members equals, and something very cool in JavaScript is that you can work on multiple lines when you're dealing with things like arrays and objects. So I'm gonna put my opening bracket for my array list here and the closing bracket for the array list here. And then inside, I'm gonna create my nested arrays. So I'm gonna have a set of square brackets and inside there, I'm gonna put in my list. So I'm gonna have the Incredible Hulk, Captain America, and Iron Man. And I'm just gonna create as many nested arrays as I have uh, superhero teams, and then we can match them up a little bit. So I'm gonna use Invisible Woman, The Thing, Human Torch, and Mr. Fantastic. And then last, X-Force, a little bit more obscure. Uh, we'll have Warpath, Cable, and Domino. And there we go. So now we have our three nested arrays inside our main array called Team Members. Okay, so now I want to just console.log that out. So we'll do that now, console.log team members, save it, and we can see it spit out. So now when it gets spit out in the console, you'll notice that it only shows you the top level unless you drill down. So to drill down, you just click the arrow, and now we can see these next levels available to us, and if we want to drill down further, we can just click on the arrows, and we can see those bits as well. You'll notice that this length that is represented here is based on this array, right? It's not based on all of the elements recursively through the array. It's only based on the surface level of the array. It's like, it's a shallow, um, it's a shallow count, okay? Um, so for example, if I click on the, the Fantastic Four list, you'll see that we have a length of four, right? Um, and then if I was to click on the X-Force list, we have a length of three. So if I was to count those, that would be, you know, 10 elements altogether, but this doesn't show 10. And that's, again, because it's a shallow count. It's not, it's not recursive, it's not a deep count. All right? <clears throat> cool. So let's go to access an element in a single dimensional array. So this is our single dimensional array here. And I want to access the Fantastic Four inside that element. So to do that, it's very simple. I'm just going to console.log it out right directly to the screen. To do that, I just go um, superhero teams, the name of our array, provide square brackets at the end of it, and then the index number. So elements inside an array are indexed, starting at zero, and then working their way up, right? So this is zero, this is one, this is two. 
So if I want to access the Fantastic Four, I need to go 0, 1. I need to access index 1. So I'm going to access index 1. And if I save, we'll see, sure enough, I've got the Fantastic Four listed there. Cool. All right. I've got so many notifications happening here, and it's a bit ridiculous. I'm just going to close some stuff off so that it doesn't keep doing that. All right. Step 3B, access an element in a multidimensional array. So this is in a single level array, and we do have, we can do the same thing kind of. So if we go to team members, we can always access index one. The thing that we have to understand though is that that is an index, or sorry, that is an array, right? We're accessing index one, which if we look at the team members array right here that we have, that's going to be this array right here, right? So it's going to return back that array. Now, if I wanted to access the human torch from that array, all I need to do is just give it another set of square brackets and name that particular index. So that index would be 0, 1, 2. So I type in 2, save, and there we go. Now I have the human torch, right? Very simple. You're probably so used to doing this. It's not even funny. You've, you've done this in every other language, I'm sure. Um, step 3C. So 3C is how to access the last element in an array. That's extremely easy. Sorry, this should be the first element in the array. I'm going to change that to first element in the array. All right, superhero teams. To access the first element, all we need to do is access index 0, obviously. And sure enough, we get back the Avengers, because that's the first element at zero index. But if I want to access the last element in the array, I'm going to need that dot length that we were talking about before. So we'll do console.log, superhero teams. And then inside the square brackets, I can actually evaluate an expression right directly inside those square brackets. So I'll type in superhero teams dot length. And I can't stop there because if I stop there and I save, you'll notice we get undefined. And the reason is, is because dot length is going to return the number of elements in the array. And the number of the elements in the array is three. One, two, three. And I'm basically saying superhero teams three, right? But we don't have an index three. There is no index three, right? Because it goes zero, one, two, three would be somewhere off here and hasn't been initialized or assigned, right? So in order to get the right number, we just have to remember to subtract one. So I'll subtract one, and that gives us x-force, which is the last element in the array. A little trickier, right? But still pretty easy to figure out. <laughs> okay, step four. A, getting the length of an array. Getting the length of array, we've done a couple of times. Uh, it's not very hard, right? We just do console.log, superhero teams, dot length. And that will give us three, right? Because there's three elements in the array. If we want to access the number of elements inside our nested array, we can go console.log, team members, dot length, and we'll get three. And again, this is because length only returns a shallow count. So it's just on the level that it's on. If I want to get the length for all of the different items in there, I would have to dig down a little deeper. I would have to provide an index number, for example. So if I provided one, that will now move into this row, right? So now we're on to this element here. If I save, we'll get back four, and that's because inside this particular element, there's four, right? There's four elements altogether. Okay, so it's important to understand that that's a shallow count, right? You can do things like, um, there is a method that allows you to basically do summing. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of it. It's not entries. Uh, it's not reduce, it's something like that. I can't remember, but basically it will actually sum all the uh, the number of things inside there, and then you can return back a sum, right? Um, 
but you would have to you would have to build it. You would have to build the recursion on your own. Basically, check to see if there's children. So you basically run through here and go, hey, do you have any children? And if you do, run through there and count the children, right? So it'd be a little bit more complex. All right. It's also important to understand that length is a property and not a method. So there's no parentheses on length. You can't call length like this because JavaScript will get mad and tell you that it's not a function, right? It's a property. So that's important to understand. Properties and methods are different. Properties are called with no um, with no parentheses, whereas methods are called with parentheses. Probably something you already know. All right, step 4b, using array length to display the elements to the console. So if I want to display all the elements on the console, I just go 4, and I, this is like a normal for loop. You're probably very used to seeing this. First, I need to initialize the uh, starting variable. So we'll use i. That seems to be the most traditional, right? And then I need to give it its conditional, right? So we have a conditional statement. So I'm going to do i is less than superhero teams dot length, right? So we're starting at index zero, and we're going to go to um, the number of elements. In fact, we're just going to go to one less than the number of elements. That's what this basically means, right? We're going to less than three. So as long as our condition is less than three, we'll keep iterating. Otherwise, we're going to stop. Right, so we'll technically stop at index two. So i plus plus, like so. We're going to console dot log out superhero teams i. And sure enough, we get the Avengers, the Fantastic Four, and X Force. And the reason why is because we're essentially the first time we iterate, uh, i will be zero, and we pass zero to here, which will be the Avengers. The next time we iterate. I will be 1, and we pass that to superhero teams, and that'll be Fantastic Four. And then the next time we iterate, this will be 2. Our condition is still valid, and we will, in, we will increment uh, and then make this 2. And then the third time we come around, I is now 3, which means this is no longer valid. This returns false. We won't increment, and we won't loop. We'll continue on with our code. Okay, so that just gives us the three teams out. Cool. All right, output both arrays to the screen, create an unordered list object. So it's a little bit more complex if we want to recursive, or sorry, not recursively, but if we want to go through our array and output it to this screen, um, we have to do a couple of things. First, we're going to use an unordered list, right? You guys have seen ULs before. We're going to use an unordered list element in HTML to display it. So first we need to actually create that element. So this is new, but gives you some experience. We're going to use the document. We're going to call create element, which is a method that comes from document. And the element we want to create is called UL. And we literally just pass the tag name right here. So if I wanted to create a paragraph, I would just pass in P. Okay. So I've passed in my team element here, right? I'm just going to scroll up a little bit. There we go. Now, it says, um, step 4D, create a loop to iterate through the teams. Okay, so we can do that. We can use a for loop. So we're going to use for let i equals zero, right? i is less than superhero teams. Same thing we basically wrote above. Dot length i plus plus. There we go. And i got to remove this curly brace because we're going to encapsulate all this code right here. So that curly brace is actually going to move to line 102. So down here, essentially, I believe. Uh, no, that's in the wrong location, sorry. Right here. One down. There we go. 110 is where we're going to put it. Right after step uh, 4F.2. All right. Then back up here again. The next thing we're going to do is create a new li element for us to work with here. Okay, so to create a new li element, uh, we're going to do let member name li equal document dot create element li. And that allows us to create a new li element. Okay. Next, we're going to take member 
name li, access the text content for it, right? And we're going to add in team members. No, I've done something goofy here. Yep, sorry, I'm way ahead of myself. I apologize. Let's uh, roll back a little bit. This is supposed to be team name li. There we go. I got a bit confused looking at my notes. Then it's team name li dot text content with a capital C equals superhero teams i. So essentially what we're doing here is we're taking the team name, sorry, we're creating an li tag, right? And we're storing in a variable called team name li. Because all elements that we have on the screen, well, most elements we have on the screen have a text content available to us, we can access the text content, which is like essentially this, right? We can access the text content and fill it with the superhero teams at that index number. So the first time we iterate, it will be the Avengers that we'll be putting in. The next time we iterate, we'll create another element and then we'll fill it with the Fantastic Four. And then the next time we iterate, we'll fill it with the X-Force, right? Next, we want to create, sorry, we want to take team UL that we have up here, and we want to basically append our LI to the UL. So we want to add a list item to the unordered list, right? So I'm going to call append, you can call append child or append, either one works, LI. And I'm going to save it. Cool. All right, step 4E, create an unordered list to nest inside the parent order list, and this will store our team members. So now we need a member UL, and that's because when we nest a list, like an unordered list, inside of another list, you can think of it like having bullets inside bullets. Um, when we do that, we have to actually put the UL inside an LI tag to be valid HTML. So we're going to do let member ul equal document dot create, sorry, create element ul, right? So there's our new ul. Under step 4e.1, we're going to create a new loop. And as we iterate through this loop, basically what we're going to do is we're going to take each one of these rows and match them up to their team but we have to do it through a nested loop. So we're going to do for let j equals zero. If j is less than team members i dot length, then j plus plus. And we're going to put our curly brace here. And then we'll need our closing curly brace uh, just after step four point e right here. Okay, so let's uh, do a quick explanation of what's happening here. So the first time I iterate through my first loop, I will be zero, right? So that will be superhero teams zero, which will be the Avengers. Then as I'm going through here, I'm going to run this iteration. And this iteration is going to start at team members zero, right? Because we're pulling that back from here. Team member zero will be the Incredible Hulk, Captain America, and Iron Man. Now I'm going to iterate through these three and assign them to their own allies and then shove them into member UL. So let's do that now. So let member name ally equal document dot create element ally. Then we're going to set the text of the ally to be the member name. The same thing that we did with the superhero team. So member name, li, dot text. Whoops, that's not going to work unless it's correct. Text content equals team members i and j, right? And the reason why we're doing i and j is because i right now will be zero, j will be zero, which means the incredible Hulk will be put underneath the Avengers. The next iteration of this loop we'll be putting Captain America under there. The next iteration of this loop, we'll be putting Iron Man, and then we'll exit, continue on with this code, and then iterate through this again.
and do the same thing for the Fantastic Four and then the X Force. I'm sure you understand how loops work, um, but I'm you know I'm sure everybody appreciates a recap every so often. All right, so member ul dot append child member name li and bam. And what this basically does is now takes this member name li with its new text content and appends it to our ul tag, right? So this unordered list, we're basically, as we iterate through here, we're populating these names as list items under our member UL. Okay? Next, we're going to move to step 4F. Under step 4F, we're going to do let team member li equal document dot create element. And we're going to create a new li tag. And that's all because we have to make sure that everything is in a nested list. Remember how we were saying that before? We want to make sure this is in a nested, a nested list element. So this is going to be our list element that we're going to put inside the team UL, but we're going to put this member UL inside of it. We're going to append it as a child inside of it. And we'll look at the actual HTML that it builds here in one second. Uh, then we're going to take team member li. And now we need to append child member UL. So now we're taking the member UL that we had before and we're appending it to it. Okay. Because now it's fully built, right? We built it right here. So now it's fully built. Now we can append it to the team member LI. Then under step 4F.2, we're going to take team UL append child team member li and what that does now is it takes the team ul the one that we set up here our main list and adds this whole thing as a list item and it cascades down right and then last but not least we need to append that whole built list to our section arrays so dot append child team ul and when I say you should see it show up over here. And sure enough, there we are. I've added some nice styling to give it the little stars, make it look kind of heroic and very patriotic. Um, but let's take a look and see what's happening here. So if I inspect, you can actually see the build, how it happened. So let's take a look and pair this up for a second. So we have our team UL, right? Our team UL is this UL element right here. It's the parent UL that we're working with. The team name LI will be the first LI tag that we have. So you can see that the Avengers, the Fantastic Four, and the X-Force. The next element will actually be our member UL, which will be stored under the team member LI. So that's the team member LI. This is the team name LI, right? Don't get the two confused. So if I click this down arrow, now you will see that we have this unordered list inside there. That's the member unordered list that we were working with. And if I click, you can see our different list items. And those are the list items that get built with this for loop right here. This is a common practice to have to iterate through nested arrays and generate lists. Um, this list is simple. Uh, some lists can get pretty complicated. I have a list. Uh, it's not the game design homework I want. It's the slash fireside. Yeah, fireside hierarchy. That's what it's called. <laughs> this takes a second to load just because it's a Heroku server and the Heroku server has to boot up every time Heroku is used. Um, when it's not used for an extended period of time, more than a half hour, it shuts off. That's why you get it for free. So this is the same idea, and it's built similarly, but I use a recursive function. Um, but these, you know, they have a nested list. This one has a nested list with a nested list, like so. Some of these go a bit deeper on their nested list. They actually go like three to four levels deep. See, they can get a little, a little much, right? We have rounds of revisions, stuff like that. So this is a common practice for building out things like this. For example, this is a Fireside web process flow. Basically, any hierarchical data. When you want to show a hierarchical data, this is a very common practice for showing hierarchical data. 
All right, let's uh, move on to step five. Everything we're going to do from here on in will just be output to the console. This is really the only design part that you actually get to see. Let's do step five, converting an array to a string. So these are array methods. Array methods allow us to do very common things. Like one, it's really convenient when you can take a bunch of array elements and turn them into a string separated by whatever delimiter you decide you want to use. Um, like for example, let's do let array string equals superhero teams dot join. And we're going to just create a list separated by a comma delimiter. And then we'll console.log that out to the screen. There we go. We'll save. And there we are. We have the Avengers, comma, the Fantastic Four, comma, exports. And this is different than this because this is an array. This is now a string. And we can actually see that if you're ever curious on how to see that. Uh, all you have to do is write type of, which is an operator, before the variable. Hit save, and you can see that that is a string. Okay? I'm going to get rid of that. Goodbye. All right. Next. There's two ways we can actually do conversion to a string for an array. We can do it this way, where it joins it together. Um, basically, join iterates and produces it as a string, and then uses this as the separator. Uh, to string just calls to string on it and everything is going to wind up comma separated still but they're all going to be butt up together so if I call array string equals superhero teams dot to string and to string is a method right and then console dot log not load so that is interesting log array string and save it you can see I get the same thing but in here I have this wonderful space, here I do not, right? And I can't actually choose what my separator is into string, I'm stuck with just the comma. Whereas at least with join, I can actually create my own separators. Um, I can say, say I want it to be separated by pipe characters. So now they're actually separated by the pipe character, right? I get to choose what the separator is, uh, whereas to string we'll just butt them all together. All right, uh, converting the string back into an array. So when you do to string, it's a little easier to convert it back into an array, right? So now I can go let string r equals array string dot split is the, the method that we want to use. And then I have to tell it what we're splitting by. So I'm going to say we're splitting by the comma. And then I'm going to say console.log string r. And you can see now that we have our wonderful array back. It's all split into its array elements. I can click the arrow, and we can see the different elements that are available inside the array. But now, this is based on the fact that there's no trailing spaces after this comma, right? This one had trailing spaces after it. This is no trailing spaces, which is fine. I can easily split there. But if I have trailing spaces after the comma, it becomes a little different. So if I do array string equals superhero teams dot join, like so, and then I do string r equals array string dot split. And then I do console.log string array and save it. You can see that I get this trailing space, actually, sorry, preceding space on the Fantastic Four and on the X Force. And that's not necessarily good because that's not normalized data, right? This is an unexpected space. And when I go to output this somewhere else, I'm not necessarily going to have handled this extra space that I wasn't expecting. So the best thing for us to do is to make sure we try to normalize our data. And either we do that by removing all the spaces in between and making it so that we're only, you know, one comma between each element, or we have to handle it because you have to take a look at the idea of if we provide a person the ability to create tags, for example, and we just say add the phrase and comma separate them, 
then we have to handle the spaces on the back end somehow. We have to handle some way to get rid of those spaces. So here's a way that we can actually fix the preceding or trailing space issue. Let's take our string array, string array, and we're going to call dot .split on it. But this time, instead of passing dot .split a string literal, we're going to pass it a regular expression. In order to do that, we first define the pattern boundaries. So two slashes equals the pattern boundaries. Everything inside will be the pattern itself. The pattern for a space in regex is slash s, but that means a single space. We need to be able to deal with if they add more than one space. Like maybe maybe they have a space here and then they have you know, four spaces here or something. It shouldn't matter to us. We shouldn't care about that. We should be able to handle that regardless of how many spaces they put between the uh, commas. So what we can do is we can either add the greedy plus or we can use a star. And the star is extremely greedy, right? And then we have our comma. That's the character that we're trying to find inside our regular expression is this comma. Sometimes you may want to escape the comma. You don't necessarily need to, though. And then we want to deal with the trailing, because this is now before the comma. We want to deal with after the comma. So we're going to do slash s star. And so what that basically says is anything before the comma, any spaces before the comma, get rid of them. And any spaces after the comma, get rid of them. OK? And it doesn't like what I've done here. Uh, oh, right, because I did this wrong. So we need the um, we need the array string. There we go. I was trying to call that on the array and not on the, the string. So now let's console.log this out. And if you look, you can see the the preceding space is gone. And now our sentence looks correct, but we can use dot split. And it doesn't really matter what the user has given us back. We can use regular expression to basically get rid of things we don't want. Okay? Which is very, very cool. Regular expression is an extremely handy thing to know. Um, there are lessons out there about regular expression. I might post one under the resources. Um, regular expression will save your bacon often, that is for sure, um, because it gives you a lot more flexibility over what the user is doing because uh, you kind of control that whole part. Like You get to control the... Um, I don't know what the feedback is, what the output is, right? Uh, okay, so we're going to do step seven. So step seven is adding a new element to the end of the array. So if we're adding a single element, we just do this. Superhero teams, and we call dot push. Push is how we push the element on, and it's x-men. So we'll push the x-men team on. And then we'll console.log out our superhero teams. And there we go, we now have a fourth element onto our team, right? Now if I want to do 7b, add multiple items to a multi-dimension, it's not much different than this, um, but why don't we do it to a superhero team, uh, at the members, we'll do it as the members. The first thing I want to do is I'm going to take team members, and I'm going to push an empty array onto the team members. So there we go. I've pushed an empty array onto team members. We now have four elements on our team members. Just this one doesn't actually have anything inside of it. And now I can go ahead, team members. And then I want to grab that last element I just did. So we're just going to go team members dot length minus one. Remember how we did that to grab the last element of an array dot push. And now I can add the members onto it. So we'll say Wolverine, Phoenix, Cyclops, Cyclops, and then my favorite, Colossus. There we go. Now we have all of our team members, and then we can go ahead and console.log that out. 
save it. And there we go. We have our four array elements. And the last ray and element has Wolverine, Phoenix, Cyclops, and Colossus. So that's the cool thing about push is you can push a whole bunch of elements onto the array. You're not limited to just calling it one at a time. You can just do it all at once. All right, step 7C. Capture the new length of the array. Okay, well, we can do that. Interestingly enough, when you add elements to an array, the return value of the push method is actually the length. So if I do console.log superhero teams dot push, we're gonna add a new superhero team and call it Sean Force. Actually, let's call it Sean Force Five. I don't know why five. It just feels like the right term. If I save that, you can see that it returns five. And the reason is is because we now in our superhero teams, if I just console.log out the superhero teams by itself. We have five elements. One, two, three, four, five. So push automatically returns the number of elements uh, in the array. So it's kind of handy. Like you can use it like this where you're not actually saving the response, or you could save the response and therefore have the length of what it is. Okay? All right, so next. 7D, add an element to the beginning of an array. And it's actually very easy to add the element to the beginning of the array. We just do superhero teams dot unshift. And that will add the element to the beginning of the array. We're going to use Alpha Flight, very, very obscure superhero team. So push will add always to the end. Unshift will add to the beginning, which is kind of cool. So unshift. Adds it to the beginning. Let's console.log. Superhero teams. And now we can see we have Alpha Flight, the Avengers, Fantastic Four, X-Force, X-Men, and Sean Force 5. We now have six elements in our total array. You'll notice that these little numbers that precede our arrays actually shows the number of elements inside that array. And that's because it's basically outputting the length automatically inside the console, which is kind of handy if you're expecting a certain number of elements. Um, it gives you a quick, you know, glance at how many elements are within that array, which is kind of neat. All right, step 7E, add an element to a specific point in an array. Okay, so superhero teams. And in order to add the element at a specific point, we're going to use the method called splice. Splice takes three arguments in total. The first one is the element that I want to start from, the index where I'm starting. So I want to add a new superhero team in between the Avengers and the Fantastic Four, right in this spot right here, okay? And in order to do that, that means I need to start where this guy starts. So I'm going to start at index two. The next argument in it is how many spots I want to move and cover, right? And I don't need to move any. I don't need to move over any. And the reason is because Splice actually does double duty. It can do either A, it can insert a new element, or it can replace an existing element. So I don't want to move over by any spots because if I do, I will wind up replacing the Fantastic Four, or I can wind up replacing all three of these or all four of these. So I need to be careful. So I'm only going to move no spots. So we're going to just, I'm going to go right in between here and squeeze, you know, this new group right in between there. And I'm going to call it the awesome sauce group. And then I'll console.log out superhero teams. And then sure enough, we have Alpha Flight, the Avengers, awesome sauce group, and then Fantastic Four. So that's cool. So now we can go to removing an element from the array. So let removed equals superhero teams dot pop. And that pops off an element from the end. So now if I call in console.log superhero superhero teams and console.log, so why don't we actually show what was removed as well? It'll spit out. Sean Force 5. So this is our teams. 
you'll notice that Sean Force 5 is missing. And when I actually console.log out removed, it returns back the Sean Force 5. So when you call dot pop, it will store inside whatever variable you're trying to make it equal to the returned element that's been popped off. This is a very destructive method. When you call this method, it permanently um, mutates superhero teams. Okay, It's not like pop it off and then it will still be a part of superhero teams. No, once it's popped off, it is gone. It is completely removed and it's not coming back. All right. If I want to actually remove only from the end, say I only want to take the X-Men off, right? I can use um, I can use Shift, and Shift will just remove it from the end. All right. Uh, no, that's that's wrong. Sorry, I'll remove it from the beginning. This is the reason why copy and paste is never a good idea. We're gonna actually remove it from the beginning. So I'm gonna take off Alpha Flight. So I'm going to go remove, I'm going to overwrite the value in this, equals superhero teams dot shift. So shift is going to remove alpha flight. And I'm just going to copy these two. And move them down. And move this guy back up where he was. <laughs> there we go. Now you can see that I have the Avengers, Awesome Sauce Group, the Fantastic Four, X-Force, and X-Men. Alpha Flight has been removed from the beginning of the array, and it was returned back to us, stored in the removed variable. Pretty cool. All right. Remove a specific item in the array. So we're going to actually revisit Splice. And like I said, Splice allows us to insert something into an array at a certain point, or just completely remove something from that point. And my my um, IDE is actually showing us what is involved. So it's the start position, how many elements I want to delete, and what the new uh, new item is. So I don't want to delete any. Sorry, I want to delete one uh, item. So I'm going to go one, or sorry, zero. I'm going to start at the beginning of this. I'm going to delete one item. So I'm basically attempting to delete the awesome sauce group from this. I'm going to delete the one item. And I'm going to, oh no, sorry, I know what I'm doing. Never mind. Helps if I read what I'm doing. Uh, vendors. There we go. We're going to start at zero, which is right here. We're going to remove this item and replace it with the mighty Avengers. That's what we're going to do. And then we're going to console.log, superhero teams. Save it, and you can see now that we've changed the Avengers to the Mighty Avengers. All right, so I've done this in the wrong spot. I'm going to just move this down here. We're going to come back up here, and we're going to introduce Splice one more time. We're going to go remove equals superhero teams, and this time we're going to remove a specific item in our array. In order to do that, we give it the index number of where we want to start, how many items we want to delete. I only want to delete one. So essentially, I'm targeting awesome sauce, and I'm going to get rid of it. And then we'll do console.log, superhero teams, and console.log, remove. And when I refresh, we now basically have our original teams back, except for this one's been changed to the Mighty Avengers. That's really the only difference. All right, what about when we want to find and replace an element in an array, right? So this one will be for a single dimensional array. If you wanted to do it for a multi-dimensional array, you'd have to build a recursive function or do some iterative kind of method to kind of go through and find what you're looking for. But we're going to do this for a single dimensional array. So we're going to do let find equal superhero teams. And we're going to use a method called index of that allows us to actually look for a specific phrase or string within an area or a value within an area. So we're going to, need to do it in x men. So we're going to search for x men. Then we're going to use splice. And we're going to pass it first the index of where x men was found. 
how many we want to delete. Well, we only want to delete the run element. And instead of deleting it entirely, we'll just replace it. If I didn't pass this third parameter, we would delete xmen entirely. And I'll show that. So console.log, superhero teams, save. We can see now it's called the uncanny x-men. If I was to remove this and save, now x-men is completely gone. Right? Splice is very, very powerful. Awesome way to like target and change information inside your array, remove information, or replace information within your array easily. Right? All right, so let's talk about some advanced array methods. We have filter and map and a whole bunch of other ones, and they're really handy, and they're very important, I think. So let's use one of the, one of the other ones. So we're going to use filter. And filter looks like this. So we'll do let result equal superhero teams dot filter. And filter is a method that actually takes a callback. And we can do a callback in two different ways. Either we can define the function anywhere on the page and write out its expressions, or we can do it inline by using an anonymous function. And we're just going to do it inline and pass it an anonymous function. And an anonymous function looks like this. It's function and the curly braces. So it's like taking this function definition, right? If I had this function definition like this, you've seen that before and just taking it and putting it right in the middle of filter is what I'm basically doing. Then I'm gonna hit enter and now I'm inside my function and I can do things. The thing is though is I want the element from superhero teams because that's what filter is going to do. It's gonna iterate through superhero teams and return to our function, sorry, pass to our function at each element. So the first time it runs, it's going to pass the Mighty Avengers. The second time it runs, it's going to pass the Fantastic Four, then the X-Force, and then the Uncanny X-Men. In order for me to work with this data, though, right now I don't have access to anything. Um, actually, I don't know if that's true. If I console.log, the wonderful keyword, this. Uh, no, it gives me window. Yeah, it gives me windows. So actually better than that is we pass in L here. Call in L here. And then I save. And you can see we have all of our our list here. As it iterates through each one, I'm just consoling, logging it back out. All right? That's pretty cool. But that's not what filter is really for, because I can do that with a for each loop. The purpose of filter is to basically return any item that meets a condition. If the condition is false, then the item will not be returned. So it's our way to basically work through our, our array and get rid of things that we don't want, right? So why don't we do it this way? We'll do return, and then our condition will be l.length. So basically the length of the element, and now it's not, l.length is not the array length, it's each individual element. So really, I'm counting the number of characters in the array, right? And basically what I'm looking for is return anything that is greater than 8. So any string that is greater than 8 is really what I'm looking for. And then I'm going to console.log at result. Now if you look at, before I save this, if you look at this, and we look at these guys, so we've got the Mighty Avengers, well that definitely exceeds 8. The Fantastic Four, that exceeds eight characters. And the Uncanny X-Men exceeds eight characters. But X-Force is shy, right? It's sitting at seven characters in total. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it definitely won't meet this particular condition, right? Because it's not greater than eight characters, which means it would have to have at least nine characters in total. So if I save this, we can see that the X-Force has been removed entirely from our array, right? So that's cool. Filter's really handy when you want to get rid of things that aren't supposed to be a part of the array. Map is a little bit different. Map basically executes a callback and returns the result back to the array, replacing the element with 
a new value. It's your way to basically work through the array and then mutate those elements as you want. I'm going to take every element inside our superheroes teams and make them all uppercase. So to do that, I go result equals superhero teams dot map. It takes a callback function like so. And then I just return L dot to uppercase. Right, we've seen that method before with the when we talked about strings. And then I'm going to do console.log result. And save it. And there we go. Now everything's yelling like an old man. Mighty Avengers, the Fantastic Four! We're just screaming inside our array. Alright. So that's cool. But what's really neat is you can actually do this a little cleaner and almost entirely in one line. And we can do that by using something that ES5 introduced called the arrow function. When we talk about functions, not next week, but the following week, we're going to look at this quite in depth because it's a very handy tool to add to your tool belt. And it's not necessarily available in many languages, but it's available in JavaScript. And it looks like this. It's result equals superhero teams dot map. Only this time, instead of adding in the callback function this way, we first say what the argument is that we want to use, the parameter, so L. We use the fat arrow, basically, which says, hey, everything after this is the expression I want you to run. If we only have one line that we're running, we don't need curly braces. We can actually just type the line out. So I'm going to run L to uppercase, like so. And then I'll console.log result. Nice and clean, get the same results, very quick, very easy to write. And, and one very thin, nice, clean, single line, right? So that's cool. We also have sort on arrays. Result equals superhero teams dot sort console.log result. There we go, the Fantastic Four, the Mighty Avengers, the Uncanny X-Men, X-Force. Now, incidentally, I think if I'm correct, I'm just going to double check this, console.log. I'm going to go uh, B, A, A, B, dot sort. And I'll tell you what I'm thinking, and then, yeah, that's what I thought. So it's doing it by looking at the numerical value of these characters based on the ASCII table. Um, it's looking at the numerical value of what A is, comparing it to B, and then returning whichever one is correct, whichever one is less. So you have to be careful with sort in that factor because you're not necessarily going to get back what you're expecting when you're trying to do an alphabetical sort you might not get back quite the alphabetical sort that you're expecting. All right? However, that being said, something that's very interesting with um, sort is this. We can take, well, I'll show you what I mean. We can take result equals 1, 3, 7, 56, 3, 5, and 10, for example call.sort, and pass it a callback function. The two elements that we want to give it is the previous value and the new value that we want to compare against. So the first time this runs, it's going to take 1 and 3. 1 will be put into A, 3 will be put into B. It will make the comparison and then return whichever one is lesser back. And it will keep doing that until it finally makes its way through the whole thing. I'm not entirely 100% sure which algorithm it uses. Um, but, you know, I'm sure we could always look it up if we wanted to. All right, console.log result. And there we go. 1, 3, 3, 5, 7, 10, and 56. Now we could use the same method to sort this by basically casting everything to lowercase and then sorting it out. You know what, why don't we do that? So we'll take, <clears throat> we'll take, uh, let's see. So we'll change this just slightly. We'll just add a function, pass in A and B, like so. 
And then what we'll do is we'll just do um, a dot to lower case compared to b dot to lower case. Actually, I think it's case with the lowercase c. Oh, no, I'm wrong. I think it is case with a capital C, actually. Okay, get rid of that guy, like so. And save. And there we go. We have B, A, A, B. <laughs> that didn't necessarily work so well. It kind of like sorted it, but not really sorted it. <laughs> it didn't actually really do anything. It compared them, but I don't think it did anything with it. I kind of expected it to compare it and then return it back. Um, I don't know. I don't care. That's fine. All right, let's move on to step C.1. Uh, with the callback comparison, we just did that. So let's grab that and we'll paste it under here because that's where it should be. Uh, the next thing we have is reverse. Reverse it should be self-explanatory. You just provide it. Well, you know what? We'll just console.log that out directly. Superhero teams dot reverse, right? And basically, it just takes the order and reverses it. So now everything is going in the other direction, right? Because we did have the Fantastic Four, the Mighty Avengers, the Uncanny X-Men, and then X-Force. Now we have X-Force, the Uncanny X-Men, the Mighty Avengers, and the Fantastic Four in a different order. And then last but not least, we also have reduce, which I think is easier to show with numbers. So we're going to do one, two. Oh, this is the sum method that I was kind of talking about. Dot reduce function A and B. And if you look at it, what it's going to do is take A and add it to B. Well, it'll do whatever I tell it to do. So I'm going to say take return A plus B. It's going to take A and add it to B. So if we do that, we have 1 plus 2, which is 3, plus 3, which is 6, plus 4, which is 10. So it should return the value of 10. Console.log, result, and save. And we're at 10. Cool. So that's it for this in arrays. If you have any questions, please make sure you send me an email and ask me in the email or through Slack. Slack should be your first point. If you haven't signed up to Slack, bad. <laughs> very, very bad. Go sign up to Slack and make sure you're on Slack so that we can communicate. All right. Uh, now we're ready to move on to the tic-tac-toe game. So I'm just going to close all this stuff off here. I'm going to close this off. We'll close off arrays, prototypes, and stuff like that. And we're going to do this guy here and get it working. And I'll show you how that works. Um, let me just load in the actual thing. Uh, control C. Give me one second. Oh, yeah, we need to actually go download it. So we'll go to here. I really hate how Blackboard collapses this thing when you didn't ask it to. It just collapses it on its own. I'm going to go to week three. We'll click the tic tac toe starter files. We'll just save those on the desktop. I'm just going to put them under Thursday so that I know where they are. <clears throat> Go ahead and extract those. There we are. I'm going to just get rid of that. Change this to Tic-Tac-Toe Thursday. So I'm going to copy that over to my IDE. <clears throat> And then just kill that. And move this back over here. Next, I'm going to take my server. CD starter tick tac to Thursday. There we go. And we'll call live server on it. <clears throat> there we are. We have our tic tac toe board and obviously not a lot of stuff in it, right? All right, let's load this up. So we have a few different pieces we have to actually do. So first, we're going to have to open up the index.array. I'm going to just go in here, index.html. The first thing we need to do is step one. Add the necessary IDs to the H1 and H2. We actually don't have to add the ID to the H1. There is no ID on the H1, but there is one on the H2. So the H2 has ID equals message, and that's where our messages are going to go. 
Step two, build the game board. Well, we need an ID on the game board. So game board, like so. Next, we're going to put a div in here, div class row, and close out our div. Then we're going to add div class cell, and close out that div, and duplicate that so that we have three inside there. Then we're going to duplicate this whole object, bam, bam, twice. All right? Make sure this is correct or it will not work. If you've done it correctly, you should see a wonderful, beautiful grid. All right? You don't have to do any styling, but you can feel free to open up the style sheet and play around with it if you want, change the colors, or do whatever you want. That's totally fine. But your, your grid should look like this between these two sections. All right, next we're ready to add the missing IDs to this section here. First, we're going to do this one, which is ID equals actions, and then the button ID equals reset. So the reset button will give us the ability to reset the game. And if you did that correctly, you should see the reset button nicely styled over here. Last but not least, we're going to want to add up our actual source, source equals main.js, like so. And then I'm going to show you how to add the opponent, opponent ai.js, like so, but we're going to comment it out because there is no opponent file inside here. If you want the opponent file, you're going to have to go get it. You're going to have to go get it from the GitHub account, download it, save it in the root folder of this file, of this folder. So it should be saved into here, and then uncomment this, and you will have your opponent. So that's your challenge, is to go get your opponent from the uh, GitHub under the week three, under weekly learning on my GitHub account. That will show me that you've actually gone there and did everything you needed to do to, to access that. All right, so now that you're done this, now all you need to do is access the main.js. So we're going to go to command T, main.js, and we have in total just uh, about 200 lines. Uh, so not too many, um, but perhaps enough that you probably would want to take a break now. <laughs> Maybe chill out for a second and then come back, because this is likely going to take us the better part of an hour. All right, so let's go to main.js when you're ready. And the first thing we want to do is we want to select and store the H1 element, which is this guy up here, the game board, which is this right here, the reset button right here, and the message, which is what's currently being displayed in here. All right, and we're going to select all those using query selector and store them. So let H1, actually, I want to start using const because we're not doing anything to the h1 to modify it. Document dot query selector h1. It is proper practice to use const. Game board equals document dot query selector. And to access the game board, we're going to use hashtag game board. Let Sorry, const reset equals document dot query selector hashtag reset. That's our reset button. In case you're trying to figure out how are we getting these, remember we we labeled them, right? We gave them that ID. We gave them those. Uh, the message is you know message because that's what we called it. Game board is that. Reset is this because that's what we called it. Uh, those are our CSS selectors that we're using to access these things. Const message equals document dot query selector hashtag message. There we go. Step 1b. Select and store all the cells into a variable. Well, up to this point, we've used query selector, but I want to use a different selector that will allow me to select an array of elements that are all the same. And I can do that by using the query selector all. So I'm going to do const cells equals document dot query selector all. And query selector all will return back an array of elements on the page, and I'm going to call dot cell on that. There we go. Now I have an array of elements, and I can view that if I wanted to. 
Uh, I'm just going to come over here, do that so we can see the bottom here, and I'm going to do console.log cells. And as you can see, I have a node list with each one of my cells. See? Cool, eh? So cool. All right. One thing you may notice is that uh, in some people's boards, it might be below the fold and you can't move the board. Um, in order to fix that, open up styles.css. I think that's the right one. Actually, it might not be. Hold on. Open up styles.css, this one here. And scroll to where it says overflow hidden. And either comment it out or just delete it entirely. And now you'll get your scroll bars back. So you can move, right? I'm going to put it back in just because I like this nice clean look. And I'm not having an issue on my display. All right, cool. So now let's go back to the main.js file. And we are on the next step. So I'm going to get rid of that. Don't need it. Step 2A. Create a variable to store two player labels. All right, well, we can do that. Let's players equals... Our first player label will be player one, and our second player label will be player two. There we go. <clears throat> Step 2b, create a variable to store the player pieces. Well, again, we'll do that. Player piece equals x and o. But you don't necessarily have to do x and o. You can do whatever you want. Same as these player names. You don't have to call them player one, player two. You can call them whatever you want. <clears throat> Step 2. C, create a variable to hold the player state. And that's because we need to know what player we're currently working with. So we're going to do that. So we're going to do let, this time let, because we can't use const because it's going to change. Current player equals zero. <clears throat> so we've set the current player equal to zero. <clears throat> so step 2D, create an array to hold all the wing conditions. There's a few different ways you can do this. If you understand magic square math, you could definitely do this with a magic square. However, I find that the easier way to do this, and I, I think if we were to benchmark it, it would actually be faster this way, um, is to just build out a wing condition array. There's only eight conditions that the winds could possibly be in, and that's the top row, this middle row, the bottom row, the left column, the middle column, the right column, the left diagonal, and the right diagonal. And that's it. There are no other conditions that it could possibly fill, right? So we're going to create an array called let win conditions equal square brackets. And then in here, we'll put the win conditions as a nested array. The first win condition will be filled with the indexes of those cells. And we're going to use zero indexing. So this would be zero. This is one, two. This is three, four, and five, six, seven, and eight. So if I want the top row, win condition would be zero, one, and two. The next row would be three, four, and five. Next would be six, seven, and eight. <clears throat> next would be... 0, 3, and 6, which is this column here. 0, 3, and 6. Next is 1, 4, and whoops, we don't want to put those in quotes. 1, 4, and 7. Next we've got 2, 5, and 8. 0, 4, and 8. And then last we have 2, four, and six. And those ones, zero, four, and eight are zero, four, eight, and two, four, and six. All right, so that covers our diagonals and then close it off and bring up the rest of our stuff up here. That defines all of our win conditions, which makes it easy to win. Now, if you really wanted to mess around, you could change these win conditions. So something like um, this, here, let's, let's reset the game. This, this, and this would cause a win. You know, you could do something like that if you wanted to, just to make things kind of goofy, right? See how smart it was? It actually blocked me entirely. Now I'm forced to block it. Yeah, you see. It's not actually smart. If you read the logic, it's not smart at all. <laughs> all right.
let's uh, finish this off. Let's game functions is what we're into now. And that's our step three. So create a function to kill the game to stop any further interactions. Well, that makes sense because we don't want the game to continue afterwards. You can see that in this play. When I've stopped, I can't click these elements anymore. They are stuck until I hit reset. Now I can play again, right? And again, I can't do anything because it's blocked out the game until I click reset, okay? We're gonna do the same thing in ours. So we're gonna have function kill game. And my ID is nicely put the curly brace here and here for me immediately. I didn't have to do anything, which is pretty cool. We're going to iterate through all of the cells, and there's a few different ways we could do that. We could either do cells dot for each, which is a method that we have available to us on arrays um, to iterate through the array. That's not a bad method. I don't mind that method. Um, I just find it kind of clunky because it requires a callback. So why don't we do something slightly different? We're going to use let cell of cells, which is an ES5 method that actually uh, iterates through the cells array and returns back the element and stores it in this throwaway variable for us. All right, which is kind of handy. Looks more like a for loop. Whoops. We need to close off that guy down here. So it's going to iterate through here. Uh, next, we're going to do remove the event listener on each cell. So we're going to actually add a, an event listener in order to tell when the user has clicked anything. But we haven't added it yet. But we need to be able to remove it when this happens. And the reason why we're removing it is because right now there's an event listener on here that allows them to click these elements, right? And it calls toggle cell when they click on these. Um, we want to remove it so that when this happens, they can't toggle it. Because if in disabled, they'd be able to toggle it. We want to actually remove the event so they can't click the buttons. Okay? So that's what that will do. We're going to add a class to it to basically gray out the cells. Class list dot add game over. Okay? And then last, we're going to change the text content of the message, which is right here. And you can see that it's changed to game over. We're going to do the same thing so that it says game over. Oh, I've missed a step. I always do this. This step needs to go down here. And this step is actually changing the attribute to disabled. But that doesn't really make a lot of sense. I'm not entirely sure why I did that. So I'm going to actually get rid of that. As Scott says, this is the first kick at the can for this course. And you always wind up having to, you know, fix some of your own logic as you go along. Because you don't realize it right away. All right. So this is just the message. We'll do message.textContent equals game over. There we go. So now when the game is over, it will just say game over. And it does that on any kill event, whether somebody wins or they don't win. Uh, here, here. See, no more moves, but it still says game over. And that's just because it calls the kill game and adds that text message. That's it. All right, we're ready to move on to the next piece. Step four, create and evaluate, and let's use grammar. Create and evaluate board function to Assess if the game is won or in draw. All right, so let's do that. So we're going to create a function called um, evaluate board. So function evaluate board. Add the curly brace. Now it didn't nicely put the curly brace down where I wanted it to go, which is pretty far actually. It's after all these steps, it's right here, after all the step fours. So around line 109 or so, okay? So I'm going to scroll back up. Step 4a, set a variable to capture how many pieces are currently on the board. So essentially what that's going to do is basically do a board count. It's going to count how many pieces are on the board because that will tell us whether or not we've met the no more moves um, uh, game state, basically. So I'm going to do let board full equal zero. So we start with zero pieces on the board. 
Next, step 4C. Iterate through the win conditions. That's this array up here. Iterate through the win conditions using the newer ES5 method for iterating through a loop. Oh, I just showed you that. That's for let win of win conditions. Okay. And that closing thing is probably down here, I'm guessing. Yeah, right before 4L. Oh, there we go. Bam. Let's add that in. Line it up so that it's in line with each other on line 91. All right. Step 4D, using destructuring, store the elements of the win array into three new index variables. Destructuring is a very cool thing that was introduced in ES5. Destructuring basically allows you to take an array of elements and immediately rip the array elements into variables. So that if you have an array element of say, Sean and then Bob and then Sarah, you could have a list of variables like name one, name two, name three equal to Bob, Sean, and Sarah, and it would immediately assign Bob to name one, Sean to name two, and Sarah to name three variable. It's very cool. And the way it looks is it's let, you essentially create an array of variable names, and then you make them equal to the array. And you have to remember that win is going to be one of these win conditions. So essentially I1 will be 0, the first iteration, I2 will be 1, and I3 will be 2. So as we iterate through this the first time, that's going to be the first set of win conditions, right? And the reason why we're doing that is because we're going to use destructuring one more time, and we're going to say let C1, C2, and C3, and this will allow us to go and grab the content that is currently inside the cells. And we're going to use these guys, because remember, these are the index numbers of the cells, in order to do that. And that's going to look like this. I'm going to do this on two lines, just because it's a little easier to look at. So it'll be cells, I1, right? That's the index number. Uh, cells. I2 and cells I3, like so. So those are going to get destructured and put into these, but that would be the whole cell, right? That would be the actual HTML element node would wind up getting stored inside this C1 um, and C2 and C3. I don't want that. I want to map back the actual text content, so I'm going to use dot map. And you can write it in either way. You can do a function with a callback, like so, <clears throat> and then return l.textContent. If you want to do it that way, that's fine. <coughs> it looks a little bizarre, but that's totally cool. Or you can use the ES5 method, which is l fat arrow uh, l.textContent, like so. And that will return back the text content of the element. These are the elements, right? That will return that back, destructured, into each of these variables. How's that for a bit of a mind bend, right? <laughs> We're actually going to look at this quite a bit, uh, especially when we talk about functions. We're going to look at destructuring quite a bit in depth. I just like to kind of introduce them a little bit here and there to get your feet wet. I, I do recommend, though, that when I introduce these things, it's a good idea to go look at this stuff on MDN, so you would just type in JavaScript, destructuring, like so, right? And there's the Mozilla Developer Network. You click on the button, and they walk you through on how to do things like destructuring. So here they've set a variable called A and B. They put it in here, and then they assign 10 and 20. And that means that A will now be equal to 10, and B will now be equal to 20, right? Destructuring is very cool. So you should always be like, when I mention these kind of things, I definitely recommend you should be looking them up. When I talk about destructuring, look it up. When I talk about the arrow function, you should go look it up because it's a way to kind of reiterate what I'm talking about. It'll make it easier for you when we go and visit again in the future. All right, now we're going to create an if condition. We're going to evaluate if the three variables have values. Essentially, we want to know 
Is there anything inside these guys? Do you have anything inside you? Is it worth me wasting my time even bothering with this win condition? Because if there's no values in these three variables, then there's no point in me evaluating them whatsoever. So I'm going to go if c1.length is greater than 0 and c2.length is greater than 0 and c3.length is greater than 0, right? So all three of those have to be greater than 0. And that's going to close out here. There we go. Then I'm going to execute this code here. Otherwise, there's no point. The whole point of this is to check to see if there's a win condition, right? So I'm going through all the win conditions, and I'm looking for three rows that have been, sorry, a row that has been completed. So either the top row, the middle row, or the bottom row, the left column, the middle column, or the bottom, right column, or the left diagonal, or the right diagonal. One of those rows has to be completed, which means it has to have three pieces in it. Remember what dot length does dot length on a string, because that's what C1 is, because we just stored the text content in it. The text content of C1 needs to contain a value. When we start this game, these are all empty, right? So the length of these would be zero, which means that if any of these have zero length, they're definitely not a win condition, right? If you're missing a piece, if I have a piece here, and I have a piece here, and a piece here, this thing just keeps stopping me. This is not a win condition because this element is missing, which means this if condition fails, right? It only passes if there's three elements in it. But notice I have three elements in here, so now this condition has passed. I have these three elements in here, but this is still not a win condition because there's an O here and there's two X's. So we need to check something else. And what we're going to do in that particular scenario is check to see whether or not the three variables are equal. But before we do that, we're going to add one to the board. So we're going to say board full plus equals one. And that basically says, hey, if all three of these elements are equal, then one of the conditions is done. It's completely done. There's nothing we can do about it now. Um, therefore, we're going to add that to the board. So that's essentially what board full is doing. Boardful isn't counting nine elements. Boardful is counting the number of win conditions, which will still cover all nine elements anyway, so it doesn't really make a difference. You can do it either way. It's totally up to you. I did it this way. Whoops. Okay, now we need to check to see whether or not the three variables are, or sorry, the three pieces are correct. We want to check to see if X is correct. Sorry, we want to see if all three of these are X's or all three of these are O's. Remember, each one of these currently contains the text content. The text content are these player pieces, right? So let's do that now. So we're going to do if C1 is equal to C2 and C2 is equal to C3, right? That's going to tell us Let's put that here. That's going to tell us whether or not we have actually, whether or not these are all X's, right? All three of these are X's, or all three of these are O's. If they're not, then this is not a win condition. So it will move on to the next win condition, which in this scenario would be here, which won't meet the first criteria, which is the length, right? And then it'll try here, and it won't meet that criteria. And then it will try here. That'll be met, it'll evaluate this. However, C1 will be an X, C2 will be an X, and C3 will be an O, which means this condition won't complete. I'm gonna let this guy win. I'm gonna put a piece here. Now, when it evaluates this row, it's gonna go C1. First of all, all three of these are completed because there's three elements. Then C1 is gonna be an O, C2 will be an O, and C3 will be an O, meaning this condition will be met. If that's the case, we're going to inform the player that somebody's won. So we're going to do h1.textContent, right? h1 is the element that we hijacked earlier. <coughs> we'll use some string interpolation using the backtick characters. You can find the backtick under the escape key. It's basically don't hold shift and press the tilde key, right? 
Remember, to evaluate an expression, we have to wrap it in the dollar sign curly braces. So current player, like so. And then we have to add one to it because our players are actually zero indexed. We've zero indexed our players, right? So we have to add one to that. All right, and then we're just going to say wins. Back tip, curly brace. All right, next in step 4J, we're going to kill the game. Remember that wonderful function we wrote, kill the game, kill game? We're going to call kill game. That'll kill the board and blot it out and make it so that you can't click anything, right? And then last but not least, in order to prevent the toggle event from changing this message, because we have an order of operations problem, we haven't actually talked about um, asynchronousity, um, but this is based, This is an issue with asynchronousity. Uh, in order to stop that from happening, we're going to return false, and that will stop that particular issue from occurring. Okay. Next, we're going to run another if condition under step 4L. I'm just going to put some distance here and tighten up these a little bit because this is a bit ludicrous. There we go. In here, we're going to have an if condition that basically checks to see if the board is full because if the board is full, then this ends in a draw, right? So wing conditions dot length. So essentially, if the board is equal to, to, to 8, and the win conditions dot length is eight characters, right? Then execute this this stuff, right? Uh, we need to close this off like so. All right, step four M. If so, inform the player players the player who has won. Well, actually, that's not true. That is definitely a copy and paste error. So h one dot text content equals no more moves which means everybody loses, right? We're going to kill the game using our kill game function. And then, step four, we're going to return false to prevent that toggle event from causing any issues. So return false. Last but not least, these are in the wrong spot. So I'm just going to move these down below this curly brace here like so. I'm going to tighten up that curly brace there. Step 4P. Return true. This will happen if neither of the events above are executed. This will tell the toggle to proceed as normal. Alright, so let's go ahead and return true here. And there we go. Once we write the toggle cell, you'll see kind of why we're returning false and returning true. All right, let's do a recap real fast of what we've done before we move on. We've selected the four elements on our page, the H1, the game board, the reset button, and the message. Then we selected all the cells that are a part of our board, starting with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, right? Because we zero indexed them. We created two um, elements in an array called players, player one and player two. We created two elements in an array called player piece, X and O. You can change these to whatever you want. Next, we created like a state variable, which will basically allow us to track which player is currently playing. So we set that to zero. We created a nested array of our win conditions, right? This could actually be a const. It doesn't necessarily need to be like that, it would actually make more sense as a const because we're not changing any of the values in here. That's the difference between let and const. Const is constant, meaning immutable. We don't change the values in these things. Let is a mutable um, scope, right? So we, it just means it's block scoped. But let means that we can change the value inside this variable. It's dynamic. <clears throat> All right, next we created a kill game function. Basically, we iterate through all of the cells. We remove the click event off each of the cells. Then we set the whole game board to game over, which really is just a class. It adds a class to game over. And if you look at the style sheet, you will see that I have a style for game over. Uh, that's what grays out these boxes. And then we change the uh, game over message, which is right here, uh, to game over. 
And now that says game over. Next, we have an evaluate board. Evaluate board is basically how we're going to define our win. We set the let full board full equal to zero. And that's our way of being able to tell if this board has all the pieces on it and there are no more moves available. Next, we iterate through each of the win conditions and evaluate them by destructuring the win array, which contains three elements, right? Each one contains three elements. On each iteration, we take those three elements and we assign them to I1, I2, and I3. Those elements are the index numbers of the win condition, right? We then use those index numbers in order to grab the individual cells on the page, on the document. And we return back, by using the map method, the text content of that cell. So we grab cell 0, we'll return back the x. If we grab cell 2, we'll return back the o. And if we grab cell 3, we'll return back this x. Then we check to see if they all have pieces inside them. We're looking at this cell, and we're seeing whether or not there's an actual x inside of it. Same with the O, same with the X, because we return back all the text content. If there's no text content, if the text content is blank, like this guy over here, then one of these will be empty, which means this condition will not be met, right? If it is met, we're going to add one to the board, meaning one of these win conditions has been completed. It doesn't mean it's actually been won. It just means that it's been completed. Once we do that, we're going to take a look at the values inside those cells, right? The text content that we stored in C1, C2, C3. We're going to compare them. Does the value of C1 equal C2? So is the X that's in C1 equal to the O in C2? And when we evaluate this particular win condition, the top row condition, this would fail. We evaluate the middle row condition, the if condition on line 77 will fail. If we evaluate the bottom row, the third win condition inside our list, this will pass because there's three elements inside of it, and then this will pass because the, all the values have the same value. They're all equal to each other. When that happens, we actually state, hey, the player one has won, right? Whatever player we're working with has won. In this scenario, player two wins, right? Then we kill the game, which grays out this board and we return false, which we'll see in a little while why we're doing that. If the board is full, this is a no moves condition, because we only have two states. Either the player one wins, right? Either a player wins or the board is full. Those are our two states. <clears throat> if the uh, board is full, meaning all the win conditions have been completed, then we add no more moves here. We kill the game, gray out the board, and return false. If neither of these things has happened, it means the game is still in play and the users can continue to play the game, which means we return true. And return true just means keep going. You're not done yet. Yeah, just keep playing. All right, I'm going to collapse that and we're going to move on to step five. Step five is going to be our toggle cell. Okay, we're actually almost done. Function toggle cell event right I'll explain this a little bit in a second here I'm going to delete that and down here I'm just going to add the closing curly brace the event is just a variable I could call this Bob if I want to it doesn't really matter the reason why I'm saying event is because I'm going to use this as an event bound uh, function when I bind the event function what will happen is when the person clicks the event will be passed to toggle cell and that event contains a ton of information that is valuable to me in order for me to interact with the uh, the user afterwards <clears throat> so for example I'm gonna get the target and the target will be the thing that they actually performed the event on that's what the target is so when they click a cell the event is the click but the target is the actual clicking thing, like what they've actually touched. So the target will be this particular element, this node that I'm working with. And just like grabbing the H1 or the message, I can now check the text content of this particular element. So I'm going to go if target 
dot text content. Sorry, I'm starting to lose my voice a bit because of the stupid flu. <clears throat> it's making my throat feel really gross. All right, text uh, target right there. Next, I'm going to add the curly brace down here. <clears throat> I kind of hate how my IDE does this. There we go. So if the text content is equal to a blank, meaning the person has clicked on the element and the element contains nothing inside of it. So if that's true, if this has nothing inside of it, right, <clears throat> then we're going to go target dot text content will be equal to player piece, the current player we're working with. Now, if we go back up and take a look at this, we can see that the current player is zero, right? Which means if I was to use that as an index number on either of these arrays, I would get back player one and I would get back X, right? That's why I'm storing the index number because these correlate to this index. Once we learn object-oriented programming, this goes out the window and we use objects to do this instead. But for now, this is the way we're doing it. All right, when I come back down here, Current player, that means it's going to grab player piece at index 0, which means that will be the x. So I am essentially taking x and making it the target.txt content of wherever this person has clicked. So when the person clicks here, it now becomes an x. Because they've clicked here, it was now filled with that piece. If I click again, you notice it doesn't work, right? Because now this condition is evaluating to false. So none of this logic inside happens. It only happens if the piece is blank. So if I click here, because it was blank, this condition was met. Okay? All right, let's move on to the next piece. So now we have if step 5D, evaluate the board and see if the player has won or the game is over. All right, so we're going to do if evaluate board, which is our function that we made up there, which will return true or false, right? If it returns true, let's go ahead and add the curly brace, the last curly brace at the bottom here. If it's true, we're going to change the player. And we're going to use a ternary statement to do that. We're going to talk about ternary statements next week. But suffice to say that that's a ternary statement. Essentially what it is is it checks this condition if this condition evaluates to true, that's what this question mark means, then it will return 1. If it evaluates to false, it will return 0. That's how it works. Then we're going to do step 5F. Inform the players whose turn is next. So we'll add the text content equals, and we'll use our wonderful string interpolation, player, dollar sign, curly braces, right? Current player, we've done this once already. Remember, we have to add one because it's just the index number. Your turn. I love it when it's commanding like that, yelling at them. Player one, your turn. There we go. So that's cool, so now we have those pieces. We have the toggle cell and we have, it's completely, uh, yeah, it's completely, it's finished. We have all the functions that we're going to need. We don't need any more functions. Um, so let's go take a look at all of our functions. We have kill game, just collapsing these so they're easier to say. We have kill game, evaluate board, and toggle cell. And it's fine if you don't quite understand this syntax. You should, though, because you've written a function likely in PHP, um, and the syntax is relatively the same. <clears throat> you've written functions in Java. Um, the syntax is different though. That's the only thing. The syntax is a bit different. But suffice to say this is how the function syntax is in JavaScript. We are going to look at functions in two weeks. All right. <clears throat> I'm going to just butt this up a bit. Step six. Iterate through the cells using a for each loop. All right. So we can use the for each loop. I don't really like it though. But it takes a callback. I guess it's no worse than say like map or something like that. It's not really any different. And then down here on line 145, I'm just going to add the curly brace and the closing parentheses and the semicolon. All right, step 6A. Add an event listener to each cell that will call toggle cell on click. So we're going to go cell, 
dot add event listener. Click. And we're going to use our toggle cell. Now, you may be like, Sean, you forgot the closing braces. You forgot these two things. This is not valid because what will actually happen is we will go sell at event listener, click, and then we will call this. We'll actually call this before any of this occurs. This thing will happen first. It will call toggle sell and then fill this here with a returned value from toggle cell, which will be false or true, which means this thing will be entirely useless. What we actually want to pass in here is the function definition, which is all of this wonderful code. All this wonderful code is getting passed into here. Now we could have did an anonymous function here and added that code. The problem with an anonymous function, when we go to do kill game and we go to remove the event listener, these two things, this and this, have to, must, no if, ands, or buts, must match. Otherwise, the remove event listener will not remove the click event toggle cell from the cell. It won't work. So in order for this to work, this has to work, right? So those both things have to match. So you can't use an anonymous function because it would just glitch out. It wouldn't actually work because there's no way to remove the anonymous function. That's the problem. So we have to give it a name. All right, so we have this wonderful thing. We're almost done. Look at that. We're so close. All right, now what's next is the call events. All right. I'm just actually going to add a marker because I can hear children coming in. There we go. All right. So this is the event on the reset button. Essentially, what this does now is now it gives us functional ability to click these things. If I click, you can see there's an X, there's the O, there's the X. There's the O, there's the X, and game is over. But my reset button doesn't work. So now I'm going to build the reset button. So reset dot add event listener. And this time we'll just use a callback because we're not ever going to remove the uh, event listener off of this. So we can use an anonymous function. All right, I'm going to just paste these guys back down here and hit the comma. And I am ready. Current player is equal to zero. We're basically just reinstating our whole game board as it was when we set it up. Cells dot for each function L, we're gonna use this loop. And it's the callback loop. It's not a bad idea to get used to this thing. Adding the anonymous function as the callback is probably not a bad idea to get used to it. Uh, L dot text content. So that's going to basically iterate through all the cells and blank them out when I click the reset button, right? It's going to make them all equal to zero, right? If I save this, uh, save, and I click, click, and then hit reset, you can see it's already doing it for me. And then here in step 7D, I'm going to go L.add event listener because remember when we killed the game, we removed the event listener, so now we need to re add it. Alright, step 7e, text content, we're going to basically return back that um, message. Step 7f, we're going to reset the message that was there, player 1, your turn. your turn like so and then step 7g the final step of our game is game board dot class list and we have to remove that class list that we originally added right because we added it now we need to remove it and that will reinstate the game so now this is our board this is the board that's completed this is our board click 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 no more moves game over and you can see our board is totally shut off so right now this is a two-player game 
You need a partner. You need to go find somebody to play with you in order to play this game. If you want to add the opponent, you're going to go to my GitHub account. <clears throat> Sorry, you're going to go to here. You're going to go to here. You're going to go to weekly learning. Resources. Scroll to wherever the GitHub link is right here. Once you're there, you're going to click on week three, opponent logic, tic-tac-toe, and there's the opponent AI. You're going to click on that file, and either you can download it, or you can go to the raw, copy it, and I would recommend going to the index file so you get the name right. Uncomment this code. Right, you're going to need this name. So you're going to go new file. And this is going to be called a opponent ai.js, right? You're going to paste that code in there. Save it. And now, if everything is good, when you click, you should see the O show up. Make sure you save this file after you've uncommented it. So I'm going to click X. There's the O. X. It stopped me. X. There's the O. X. I stopped it. X. And no more moves. Now, just a quick run through. If you're done and you're happy with what you know, you can finish this video and close it out. If you want to know how the opponent AI works, I'll give you a quick run through. This is written simply, and I wrote it simply just so it would be easy for you to understand. I don't, because you're new to the language, I'm not saying that you don't understand it, but you're newer to the language, so I made the logic fairly simple. I would say that there's probably ways to clean this up and make it a little easier. Um, I don't know, maybe it depends on what we look at. Uh, let's take a look. So I'm going to just collapse this back. So basically the way this works is there's a few functions. I have random array element, which just basically returns a random element from the array. So if I was to feed cells into it, it would return one of those cells randomly back to me. Okay. Um, this is the click and win. The click and win ba basically works by uh, iterating through, sorry, it takes a look at the win condition that's been passed to it, provides this thing the cells, right? and checks to see if the content is empty. If it is, it will click it. That's basically all it is. It's doing your click event. Essentially, this is the way for the computer to actually click the cell, right? Because it does the same thing you do. Set interval is basically a loop. It's a constant loop that you can delay. And I'm delaying it for 500 milliseconds, which means half a second. So every half a second, the computer will attempt to try to put a piece down. Right now, it's not its turn. So if the current player is equal, equal, equal one, which means it would be its turn, right? Because we use zero index for player one, um, one index for player two. If it's its turn, when it's iterated through, it's going to go through and execute this code, right? So this condition has to be met in order for it to execute its code. So if I click, then it took its turn. I click, after 500 milliseconds, it's taken its turn. It's actually taking its turn every 500 milliseconds. It's dumb. It doesn't know that I've done anything yet. We could change logic inside main.js that once I've clicked, it will take a turn. But this is cool because you can layer it on or disable it if you want to play with two players, right? All right, so let's pretend that it's its turn. So let player one possible wins is an empty array and let player two possible wins is an empty array. This is a way to keep track of possible wins. A possible win, like right now for example, I have an X here and an X here. That means this diagonal win condition is a possible win because this is empty and I can go here to win, right? It would have recorded that information inside here as a way to stop me. Player two possible wins means it has an O here and an O here, and then this is blank. It will record that as a possible win condition. So that way you can keep track of it. Next, I iterate through all the win conditions. I do the same logic that we did before with destructuring. I then check the number of player one plays and the number of player two plays. This basically looks for... Um, it looks at the win condition and it sees how many pieces are player one pieces and how many pieces are player two pieces. 
So in this one here, there would be two player one pieces and one player two piece, right? So this would say two, and this would say one, essentially. Then I iterate through all of the text and basically record back what ones of these are the uh, piece, right? So I'm basically just checking to see if it's an X, checking to see if it's an O, and if it is, then I just add one to each of these. This is called an inline if condition. Uh, we'll look at that next week when we do our uh, conditional statements and loops. We'll look at inline if conditions. Next, I run, I check again to see if the player one plays is equal to two, and if player two plays is equal to zero. That means there's two pieces in here, but the third piece is missing. If that's the case, I say it's a player one possible win, because that means he has an X, he has an X, there's no O there, if he goes in that spot, he's going to win. So it's a possible win. So I store that under the possible wins. If the player 2 has the same issue, then it becomes a player 2 possible win. So if there's two O's, but the next spot is blank, then I shove that in as a possible win condition. Right? This is an important part, though. This 0 has to exist because that's what tells me that the other spot inside the win condition is still empty and ready. Attempt to win. The first thing the player 2 will do, the first thing the computer attempts to do is win. If it has two O's, it will fill in the third O. And we can test this. So here's my X. There's its O. Here's, um, here's my X. There's its O. So what it's doing right now is it is attempting to win. It's got its O in place. It's put its second O in place. It wants to complete this. That's what it's going to do over anything else, if including stopping me. So if I put my X here, it's not going to waste its time stopping me. It's going to complete its win. So if I put my X, it completes its win. And that's because it fires off this logic before it does anything else and then returns if it's true. If it doesn't have two pieces but I do, like this, then this condition wins, right? Because now I have a possible win and it needs to stop me. So that's what it's done. It's attempted to stop me, okay? In order for it to win though, it's gonna have to go here. If I stop it, it will now fill in the next spot, which is it's trying to attempt to stop me again. That's why it's done it. Right now, it's next move is very likely here. That's where it wants to go next. It wants to complete its position and fill in its spot here. I don't want it to do that. I want to win. It wasn't able to stop me entirely because I had two possible win conditions, right? That's where it's a bit of a glitch. It's not very strategic. So I could go here and it's immediately going to attempt to stop me here and then I have my last place there. However, we have to look at the fact that when I first play a piece, there's no win condition that's possible for either one of us. When I first lay a piece, it randomly selects a location and drops a piece in the place. So if I click reset, it did it there. If I click X, it did it there. Click X, it did it there. It's never the same. Well, it's not true. It's one of the random nine locations. It will drop a piece. Right. The way this works basically is I select back a random array element, one of the cells, and while the rando.text content is a blank, it will place a piece. Otherwise, sorry, while it's not a blank, it will call rando again and attempt to try again. If it is a blank, then it will click it. It will click that random cell because it's pulling back all the random cells. And it does that every 500 milliseconds. I'm not sure how fast I can make this till it breaks. So if I click X, 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 yeah, it's pretty fast. I don't think I can drop it to one though. I don't think it's that good. Oh, it is. Yeah, so maybe 500 milliseconds, you don't necessarily need to go that high. Um, but you have to remember that this runs asynchronously. So set interval is running outside of my particular turn. So it is possible that in 500 seconds, for example, I could click and force it to go to the O position, right? 
and I can click and go here, like so. And then I can click and go here. As long as I do that within half a second, faster than it, I can force it to go places it doesn't want to go. Okay, And that's due to the asynchronicity. So you may want to lower this number just to make it a lot harder. Like I don't think I can click in one hundredth of a, of a second. Yeah. I'm not that fast. <laughs> yeah, I'm not that fast. So yeah, you may want to lower that number in order to get it. But that's basically how it works. So uh, that's it for me. If you have any other questions, please let me know. I have no problem answering questions on Slack. If you're going to send me an email, make sure you include your name and the day that you uh, attend my class. Um, other than that, oh wait, I almost screwed up. We are actually missing one other part here. We have, hold on, do do do. We have a lab. Here's the lab. So if you go to labs, you'll see lab two, the comic character generator. So click on that. Download the starter lab one dot zip. So I'm just going to download that and show you basically what's in there. I'm going to unzip it, show in the finder. Here's starter1.zip, right? Uh, let's just load that up in the IDE. Let's do starter lab. KV. I'm just going to close all these off. And we'll open the lab. So in the lab, you're going to find four files. The character data.js file is just a list of characters and adjectives, origins, alter egos, and powers and stuff. It's not really anything you need to bother yourself with. You're not going to edit it. The first place you're going to start, same as styles.css, you can edit styles. I've left it intentionally blank. You're welcome to do whatever you want with the styles. If you want to add some style, that's totally cool. Um, you want main.js and index.html. So in this lab, you're going to need to attach the style sheet and you're going to need to attach the main.js file. I've already attached the character data file for you. You need the JS file here. Next, you're going to open up the main.js file and you're going to follow through all of these steps. And I believe there is, there's not that many. Yeah, there's, there's seven, I don't know. Maybe 15, 25, 35, probably 35 steps or so, 35, maybe 40 steps. About 135 lines of code in total, so not a lot. The idea is that you're going to build a comic character generator. And I'll show you what that looks like. Let me uh, man T here and we'll navigate to where I've got mine. Oops. Uh, no, actually, I'm in the wrong folder here. There we go. There we go. <coughs> Oops, I went to the wrong file. Uh, not feeling the best here. <laughs> Lab one. There we go. Live server. <coughs> there we are. Okay, so we'll go to lab one complete. So this is the completed lab and what it looks like. So basically, as you refresh the lab, it changes out this information. It generates a random superhero name. It gives it a random alter ego, tells you its random power, and then gives you a random character type. And then it generates a random story. So in this scenario, a bright light filled the classroom, vaporizing all the students except one. Roger Stevens. They were entrusted to be the miraculous wizard Hungry and were given the power of water. Doesn't always make sense. <laughs> uh, this is the amazing Doctor Man. Strange insect fell from the ceiling. The insect bit Kent Clarkson, giving them the power of a spider and turning them into the amazing Doctor Man. Uh, if you refresh, a bright light filled the classroom. So, like, I've only got maybe four events that occur. Uh, you could write your own, though. I can show you how to write your own. Um, inside here, uh, KB, if you open up character data, those are in here. And if you just follow this same kind of logic, you could write up your own. So you can do like, this is character, right? With the colons like that. 
Um, basically, you just wrap those variable names with those colons, and yeah, you can totally write your own story if you wanted to, uh, and have it be part of one of the ones that gets uh, generated, like the origin of the nefarious Mr. Canada. That that's pretty cool. That actually worked out really well. The vile Mr. Boy, the fearless super beast. I like that one. That's awesome. Anyways, uh, that's your lab. To know what to do, you go to view rubric. Tells you the breakdown of everything. So um, I generally weight these differently. So you'll notice that the HTML page is only a 5% weighting. No errors is a 10% weighting, which means if you get errors and you can't get it to actually execute, <coughs> your total loss will only be 10%. I will go through and make sure that everything works basically, um, but you will lose that 10% deduction for it not working. Uh, generates a new character, 20%. A new origin story, 20% and generates the stats table, which is this here. Generates the stats table, um, hold on, uh, is worth 20%, and then each step has been completed, meaning you've gone through and you've completed all of the steps in the main JS file and you haven't left any blank, that is worth 25%, and I deduct, um, I deduct quite a bit actually for each missing step. Right? Plus you're going to lose the 10% because your application won't work if you're missing the steps. Um, that's basically it in a nutshell. Uh, good luck to you. It is due. Let's see. It is due September 30th. So you have 10 days basically to complete it. Um, actually, that's going to change. I need to change that due date because the other class is behind. So it will be due the first week of October. All right? Uh, other than that, have a great night. Have a great weekend. And I will see you all next week. Um, cheers.